Hey Evan and everyone watching, thank you so much for featuring my ideas and my thoughts. I've been following you for a long, long time, so I'm really excited to see this come together. If you really want to achieve something, you'll find a way. And if you don't, you'll find excuses. I grew up in a family where you could either be a doctor, a lawyer, or a failure. Those were my three options. Anything else would just count me as a failure. I love that I doubt myself and I hope I never stop. Need motivation? Watch a top 10 with Believe Nation. What's up, Believe Nation? It's Evan. I believe in you, and this channel is designed to be a part of your daily success routine. So let's get your motivation to a 10 and get you believing in you. Grab a snack and chew on today's lessons from a man who went from being a rebellious kid growing up to studying and becoming a monk in India and Europe to now using his wisdom to inspire millions of people around the world. He's Jay Shetty, and here's my take on his top 50 rules for success. Okay, let's kick it off with rule number one, be exposed to new experiences. At 18, I was really fortunate when I met a monk and this monk was invited to speak and I kind of just went because one of my friends forced me to. At that time, I was listening to CEOs and entrepreneurs and business people and marketers who, who I thought that's what I was aspiring to be like. And then I hear this monk and he captivated me like no one had ever captivated me before. It was like staring at the most beautiful woman on the planet. You know, I was completely fixated on him and his message. See, we live in echo chambers. We're just surrounded by the same thinking. How often do you bump into a monk? You know, it just doesn't happen. You don't have, no one has a dinner party and goes, oh yeah, we just invited the monk, you know, from town, like the local monk. Like no one ever does that. And so you, we meet people who are just like us most of the time. And we talk about this in business all the time. If you want to be a billionaire, spend time with billionaires. If you want to be a millionaire, spend time with millionaires. If you want to be a tech startup, spend time with, you know, that's, that's the common rhetoric that we hear all the time. But what if you want to find purpose and master the mind? There's no one better than a monk who's mastered the mind. So, so for me, the first step is just opening yourself up to new experiences and new role models. Because most of us can't see ourselves in people so then we try and fit ourselves into the boxes that we do see. And, and I mean, there's this beautiful quote that I, I've been saying it everywhere and I wish I wrote it, but I didn't. So it's by a philosopher and writer named Cooley. And he said that today, I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. Right, and just let that blow your mind for a moment. It's, uh, it's so powerful. I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. So we live in this perception of a perception of ourselves. Hence, my identity is made by what my parents think I should be. My identity is made up by what my college or university thinks I should achieve. While you're living in that bubble and that echo chamber, getting to what you really want to do is impossible because maybe that just doesn't fit. And I think so many people feel that way today, that they don't fit into the current education system. They don't fit with the three or four or five careers that you're taught exist. So that process of self-excavation and actualization first requires being exposed. You can't be what you can't see. If I never saw a monk, I would never have wanted to be a monk. If I never meet a billionaire, I wouldn't want to be one because I wouldn't know what that feels like. I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what it takes. And, and I think that's the biggest challenge of our society, that we're not exposed. So that's the first step, being exposed to unique experiences and role models. Second step is finding that experience or role model that you're passionate about. And exactly like you said, taking it seriously, shadow them, network with them, spend time with them, observe them, even from afar. It takes that observation, being addicted to observing that person's lifestyle. And then the third step is going yes or no. Does that work for me? Not everyone who's gonna go off and become a monk is gonna feel like the way I did, and that's cool. But not everyone is gonna go and follow and shadow a billionaire and go, that's exactly the lifestyle I want. They may want the result, but do they want the hard work that goes with it? And so for me, that's the third step. It's observing, focusing, shadowing, getting as close to the process of that individual, and then going yes or no. Do I want that process? Not do I want the result. 
Mm. Everyone wants to be that monk who's fully enlightened, you know, can walk through, has an incredible aura that people just gravitate towards. But when you realize he has to wake up at 2 a.m. every day and sleeps about four to six hours, you're like, ah, you know, I don't want to do that. <laughs> that. That doesn't sound like me. Rule number two, believe. Second thing we usually get wrong is that we don't believe in what we're sharing. I've realized that I've grown much more confident about speaking in front of people and even in front of you right now on video because I talk about stuff that's really meaningful to me, that's really purposeful to me. I only choose to share messages that truly resonate with my heart and my head and my intelligence and things that I've immersed myself in for a number of years. Everything I'm sharing, these stories, these ideas, they aren't just made up to sound good. These are things that I really truly try and live and practice and embody in my own day-to-day -day life. And therefore, if you don't really believe in what you're speaking about, if you don't really understand it, if you haven't tried to live it, then you're always going to struggle trying to articulate it. And even if you get away with articulating something perfectly that you don't believe in, you'll feel empty inside. And that's why sales roles usually end up making people feel quite empty because they're selling stuff and products that they don't think will change your life. Make sure if you're trying to communicate a message for your brand, if you're trying to sell a product, if you're sharing insights and ideas they have to be things that genuinely connect with you internally this this feels weird are you are you sure this is legal rule number three refine your intention my daily practice is to refine my intention the the biggest weeds that we all get is on our intention so when i say intention i mean my current intention is to use everything i've been given everything that i have in the service of others so I wanna use the following that I have to help people. I wanna use the money that I have to help people. I wanna use the network that I have to help people. Mm -hmm. But every day that intention, which is a beautiful little plant that's growing, gets weeds around it. No, do it for the money, I hear that <laughs> voice, right? Uh, do it for the fame. Just do it for the fame, do it for the followers, do it for this, all these weeds are like going around my real uh. intention every day. Every day, that's a weed. A weed is the intention that you don't want. And the problem is, sometimes you've let it grow so much, the weed looks like the plant, right? right. The weed looks like your intention and you start believing it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. So for me, my daily practice is going back in, reflecting on what is my voice right now in my head? What am I saying to myself? And I'm hearing, make that deal, it makes a lot of money, do this, do that, do this, more followers, fame, all that stuff and I'm cutting it down. I'm cutting that weed every day. And you've got to do it every day because the more you're surrounded by that energy, right. the more it's <clears> gonna <throat> keep creeping in like a creeper weed. Rule number four, know your element, environment, and energy. So for me, my three E's are element, environment, and energy. Everyone has an element that they thrive in. If you take someone out of it, their element, they won't be the same. A modern day example would be Michael Jordan. He was incredible at basketball. You took him out of basketball, put him into baseball, no one remembers his career. We're talking about one of the best athletes of all time. Your environment is the environment around you. You can take a fish out of water and give it a beautiful mansion and a Bentley and all the money in the world, but it would die. And that's what we are, like our environment. Everyone needs an environment which they thrive, which we have to craft. Your boss, if you're at work, is never gonna ask you, hey, what, what environment do you succeed in, right? Like, that never happens. So we have to create an environment where we thrive. And then finally, it's energy. We, some of us love high energy environments, high pressure. Some of us succeed in low energy environments and low pressure. Figuring out your energy and the frequency on which you operate best will help you thrive as well. So for me, those are the three E's to really create a thriving environment. Know your element, know your environment, and know your energy. And so at all times, if I see anything going wrong, I'm going, is my element out of alignment? Is my environment out of alignment? Or is my energy out of alignment? And that's a great three question test you can do to yourself when you don't think things are going right. And all you have to do is bring that back into alignment. Rule number five, practice. We usually don't practice enough. I realize that if you really want to be good at something, you have to invest in it with all your life. You have to become addicted and absorbed to improvement and growth. That means being open to feedback. That means being open to what the experts have to say about you. It means not being attached to your ego and how you feel about yourself, but opening up yourself to an expert group of people to give you insights on how you can grow, evolve, and perform at a higher rate. And linked to that is practice 
practice, practice, practice. It's literally impossible to do something perfectly the first time you do it. The more you do it, the better you get. And we think practice is a cliche that we hear all the time, but actually it's that truth. It's so simple, you might miss it. Did I miss something here? Rule number six, make it happen right now. I'd like you to fast forward to 70, 80, 90 years old, right? Fast forward in your mind to that age, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, if you're really optimistic, whichever one it is. And I'd like you to write down what will be the things that you'll regret that you didn't do. Imagine you're that age, ask yourself the question, what will I regret that I didn't do? Not what you did do, but what you didn't do. Write it down, make a long list right now. Get a pen and paper out and write it down. Don't do it on your phone, don't do it on your laptop. Actually get a pen and paper and write down your answers. What will be the things that you regret that you didn't do? Right, really think about it. Will it be, you know, learning a new language? Will it be moving home? Will it be telling someone you love them? What will it be? What would it have been? Write it down right now. Now the incredible thing about this question is that you're using the future to empower the past. Whatever answer you have in that qu question, whatever your answer is, you can do it right now, today, starting today, because you're not that age yet. And if you're, even if you're 64 and you're tuning in 70, 80, 90, you're still there, right? It's still possible. You can start doing that right now. It's empowering the present with the future. There is nothing stopping you for making it happen right now. You don't have to feel that way when you're 70. You don't have to feel that way when you're 80. You never ever have to feel that way if you start doing it right now. And you can do it right now. Even if it feels impossible, you can start working on it right now. You can start trying right now. You can start making plans right now because you're not there yet. And this is where you start. This is where you start making it happen. It's all in the now. Rule number seven, find your passion. So how do I find my passion? My simple model, which is the Dharma model, it also, Dharma means eternal duty in the Vedic tradition. It's very similar to what Ikigai is being spoken about today, which is a Japanese version of reason for being. Why do we live? Where is meaning coming from? And it talks about an intersect of four areas. What am I good at? What do I love? What does the world need? And how do I get paid for it? To me, those four help you unlock your passion. When you find the intersect across all of those four, you're making your passion your purpose. You'll unlock your passion, you'll find your purpose. This is path one, there's two paths. Path one, I find my skill set and I engage it to help other people and become better at it. So I'm becoming better at what I'm good at and I'm using it to help other people because I'm aware of what I'm quite good at and I know what, what knowledge I have, what skills I have. I have some self-awareness. The other path that people often miss is actually I just start serving people. I just start helping people and I start to notice what I enjoy about that and what I'm good at helping people with. So that's Gandhi's part. Gandhi said that you find yourself when you lose yourself in the service of others. So for me, those are the two paths of how do I find my passion and finding the intersect between those four areas. Rule number eight, overcome challenges. You have to remind yourself that it's okay to feel the way you feel when you're going through a difficult time. It's okay to feel weak. It's okay to want to cry. It's okay to feel overwhelmed. Just reminding yourself that it's okay. This is my number one way of how to find strength in difficult times, is reminding yourself that the way you feel is okay. To honor that feeling, to accept that feeling, to actually be okay with that, what we see or what we perceive to be a weakness, or what we perceive to let us down, or what we perceive is a sign of you know, instability or insecurity, we've got to remind ourselves that when things are tough, it's okay to feel that way. There's nothing wrong with that. Any difficulty I go to, I look to moments in history where people have endured the same pain, if not more extreme, and analyze, absorb, and connect with how they got through it. I like to see what they were thinking. I like to see what they did. I like to see how they structured themselves. I like to look at how they organized. I looked, like to look at who they were speaking to. I like to look at what was going through their mind at that time because you've got to remember that any challenge we're facing today, we've faced it before as, a, as humanity, right? Beyond 
ethnicities, beyond color, race, creed, beyond backgrounds, beyond all walks of life. As human beings, we've been through challenges before and we've got through them. And therefore reconnecting with how that's been done before is a beautiful way of learning how to overcome current challenges. So you can either look at your past, but real wisdom lies in looking at the past of people who made a difference. You look at people like Martin Luther King, you look at people like Gandhi, you look at people who made world-changing differences, not single-handedly, but influenced from a single perspective, from a single point of view, and really connecting with the powerful moments in history. I've said this quote many times, I've read it many times, and this quote actually is, is unbelievable. And the quote says that they thought they buried us, they didn't know we were seeds. Right, it's a Mexican proverb. They thought they buried us, they didn't know we were seeds. And I was thinking, these, when you tell yourself that story, you start thinking much more differently, right? A seed is buried too. It's incredible that the seed goes through the same process as anything else. It's put deep underground, right? All of this mud is put on top of it. It gets rained on, it gets snowed on, all these kind of things, but it knows that it's a seed. So it knows that it can grow, so that anything's possible and it grows through, and you see even plants growing through concrete sometimes, right? It's unbelievable how much power a seed has. So changing the stories we tell ourselves, we can either look at challenging situations as opportunities for growth, as an opportunity to learn, as an opportunity to change, be the change, or we can look at them and, and really feel down. Now, that, that second part is okay. We can even feel like that, right? But we have to recognize it's not permanent. We've got to accept that none of our feelings are permanent. They don't need to be permanent, it's a choice. So if you need to vent, vent. I was saying to someone yesterday, if you need to vent, vent. If you need to rant, rant. If you need to complain, complain. If you need to share how you feel, do that. But recognize that those feelings are not permanent and it will be amazing when we realize we are seeds, right? That is the most powerful way of finding strength. Rule number nine, redefine failure. In the middle of 2009, he was the software engineer that no one wanted to hire. He had 12 years of experience at Yahoo, but he was rejected by Facebook and then rejected by Twitter. He'd been to a great university, he had a great CV, but he decided to team up with one of his alumni members at Yahoo and started to create an app and focus on the startup space. In five years' time, he sold that app for $19 billion to Facebook. Believe it or not, that was Brian Acton, the co-founder of WhatsApp. When he was rejected from Facebook, he said it was a great opportunity to connect with some fantastic people. I look forward to life's next adventure. When he was rejected by Twitter, he responded by saying, worked out, it was quite a long commute. It's so interesting to see that someone rejected from two of the top internet companies actually responded with humor and actually responded with positivity. This lady was diagnosed with clinical depression. Her marriage had failed and she was jobless with a dependent child. She was on a four hour delayed train journey from Manchester to London when she came up with this idea and she started to write this book about this wizard. And as she started writing, she then finished her manuscript, took it to 12 publishers and was rejected by all 12. Believe it or not, that's JK Rowling. This man watched his first company crumble. He was a Harvard University dropout and his first company's demo didn't even work. He went on to build Microsoft. His name's Bill Gates. Therefore, failure is just a sign that we need to widen our scope. We need to be ready and build ourselves up for the next level. Actually, what we end up achieving is far greater than what we'd envisioned for ourselves. And this divine plan, this orchestration can't be happening without this intervention that occurs because if we had it our way, we just settle, we just accept what we thought was our goal, what we thought we were chasing. But actually I've noticed that when you don't get that, later down the line you look back and you reflect and realize that what you've gained is so much greater. Failures are only failures when we don't learn from them because when we learn from them they become lessons and we actually extrapolate all of these teachings and actually get more insight into how we can improve the way we work and how we can actually drive with a different energy. The challenge we have is that we only talk about people's failures when they succeed and that's why they become this taboo or we feel like their failures never happened. We need to share these stories earlier. We need to bring out these stories and experiences on the journey so that people who are on the journey can actually follow in those footsteps. 
And that's why Steve Jobs said you can't connect the dots moving forward. You only can when you're looking backwards. Rule number 10, decide to be a pilot. In life, you're either a passenger or a pilot. You've got that choice. This is one of the biggest choices you'll ever make. Are you defining what direction you're moving in or are you letting other people make the biggest decisions of where you're going? See, at first, it's more comfortable being the passenger. You sit back, relax, have people serve you. It feels easier. It feels more natural. But then as time goes by, you look outside the window and you realize you've ended up somewhere that you didn't want to be. Then you start blaming people around you, blaming people who made those decisions for you, blaming people who should take responsibility for where you've ended up. Sometimes you feel lost, confused, and wonder how you ever got there. And in that moment, at that time, you've got this important choice to make. You can either switch seats, grab hold of the steering wheel, and start guiding your life, or remain a passenger. You can't be both. Which one are you? Rule number 11, have a plan. How many of you have a crazy dream or a crazy goal? I want you to write out in the comment section, what is your crazy dream? The dream that keeps you up at night is the real dream you should be chasing. But to chase that dream, to find that dream, to make that dream a reality, you need a strategy, right? A dream without a plan is just a wish. Tony Robbins said that, right? A dream without a plan is just a wish, right? Without a strategy, without a guiding philosophy, without guiding principles, without actually creating a clear plan. I used to have this economics teacher, and I want you to think back to school as well. Maybe you had one. I remember this economics teacher. He walked in to the classroom, and the first thing that he wrote on the board, he didn't even tell us his name. We didn't even know who he was. And he turned up, he went inside the classroom and he wrote on the board, he said, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And all of us just burst out laughing. This guy hadn't even told us his name yet. But on the board he wrote, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. And now when I look back at that, and as I grew up and hopefully became a bit more mature than I was in high school, I remember thinking about that statement. I'm thinking, how true is that? that when you're not prepared for something, you miss out on um, unbelievable opportunities. Now, I'm not saying good things don't happen spontaneously. Sometimes things happen by chance, randomly, etc., with a reason. But when you're prepared, you can capitalize on things in a huge, huge way. Rule number 12, live in your element. Play to your own element. Don't try and perform someone else's expertly. So in modern terminology, or how would I say that is, don't waste your time, Steve Jobs, don't waste your time trying to live someone else's life. You know, don't be trapped by dogma. Focus in on your own strengths, your own element, what you have to offer. Don't get lost in trying to become like someone else or mm -hmm. pretend to be someone else. There's a beautiful, one of my favorite quotes by Einstein and then Steve Jobs again. Einstein said, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will spend its whole life believing that it's stupid and too many of us are fish trying to climb a tree, too many of us are monkeys being taught how to swim, too many of us are lions being taught to live like cats. We're not getting to live in our element. So my second piece of advice is live in that element that you've naturally been given. Don't try to adopt another. You know, mm -hmm. we've all got a special genius inside of us. It was Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, this conversation. Steve Wozniak looked, Steve Wozniak, for those who don't know, is the tech guy behind Apple. He practically invented the technology and the mm -hmm. software and everything. So Steve Wozniak looked at Steve Jobs and he says, this is in Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs. Steve Wozniak, Wozniak looks at Steve Jobs and he says, what do you even do? He said, you're not a coder, you're not a designer, mm -hmm. you're not a marketer, and you're not an engineer. What do you even do? Imagine challenging Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs replies, he says, he says musicians play their instruments, I play the orchestra. That is the most deep understanding of one's role in life and not getting lost in other people's identities and perceptions of you. Steve Jobs knew that he wasn't a marketer, he wasn't an engineer, he wasn't a coder, so he hired all of those. But he played the orchestra, he brought it all together. And that's when you, when you find confidence in your own role, you won't be envious of anyone else's. Mm -hmm. Rule number 13, don't let failure stop you. During a research experiment, a shark was placed into a large tank of water and then some small fish were released into that tank. 
As you would expect, the shark quickly swam around the tank, watched the fish, and then ended up eating all of them. Then, a strong piece of fiberglass was inserted into the tank. This would create a division between where the shark started and where the smaller fish started. Again, the shark quickly attacked. But this time, the shark went in straight into the fiberglass divider and bounced off. It tried this several times, again and again and again, until it became tired and weakened. Meanwhile, the fish on the other side of the divider carried on swimming peacefully. After about an hour, the shark finally gave up. This experiment was repeated several dozen times over the next few weeks, where the shark became less aggressive every single time. It got to the point that the shark stopped trying to attack and eat the fish at all. The fiberglass was then removed out of the tank. And to their amazement, the shark still did not attack. The shark had been trained through habit that a fiberglass divider was there and that it would bounce off and therefore didn't even consider it. At the same time, the small fish freely swam wherever they wanted. The moral of the story, Many of us are experiencing setbacks and failures in everyday life. Eventually, we get emotionally drained, tired, unmotivated, and we stop trying. Like the shark in the story, we believe that because we've been unsuccessful in the past, that that barrier still exists even for new ventures. In other words, we continue to see a barrier in our heads that separates us from our dreams. Even though there is no real barrier between where we are and where we want to go. And remember this, the teacher has failed more times than the student has even tried. Rule number 14, believe in your mission. Fred Smith was an undergraduate at Yale University in 1965. As part of his coursework, he wrote an economics paper exploring the transportation of goods in the United States. It's how things get delivered to you and me. He found that shippers were transporting large packages and items either via truck or through passenger airplanes. He thought he had a more efficient method. He wrote a last minute paper, as you do, about how a company transporting small items via a plane would be a much better business model. Because he was rushed, he never really got around to explaining in the paper how that company would run and he ended up getting a C. The funny thing is, he still didn't give up and in 1971, he actually launched the company he was speaking about. But within three years of founding the company, Federal Express, as it was called, was actually on the verge of bankruptcy. They were losing over a million a month. That was because of rising fuel costs, competitors in the same market, and at its zenith, it was only worth about $5,000. Smith even made a final pitch to General Dynamics hoping for more funding and it was rejected. Most people at this point probably would have just shut down. Rejection, the grade C, losing a million a month. But Fred Smith had different ideas. Smith actually ended up flying to Las Vegas that weekend with all of what the company had, the $5,000. The Monday morning after, the company had $32,000 thanks to his blackjack skills. That money made it possible to cover fuel costs for just a few days more. Soon after the company was able to raise significant funds, he went around to multiple places to find sponsors, investors, people that believed in what he was trying to achieve as a service. The amazing thing is that he was creating a company that we all know today. It's called FedEx. It now operates in over 220 countries and has an annual revenue of over 45 billion dollars. The interesting lesson that we can learn here is that there were countless occasions in Fred Smith's life where he could have said, that's it, it's not working for me. He could have stopped when he got that C for the paper. He could have stopped when he was losing a million a month. He could have even stopped when he finally only had enough to just last a few more days. But he believed in his vision. He had belief, he had conviction about his idea and the process and the service that he was creating. And that's the lesson here. If you really really want to achieve something, you'll find a way. And if you don't, you'll find excuses. Rule number 15, have a strong why. I think Mark Zuckerberg said it brilliantly at Harvard. He was saying that finding your purpose isn't enough. You have to help other people find theirs. And I know you're passionate about mm -hmm. this. Whatever that definition is, but it has to lead everyone. So if I'm, whether I meet a celebrity, an entrepreneur, or whether I meet someone who's starting out, I'm always asking them the question, how can you use what you have to make a difference in the life of other people? Yeah. Because if you start there, everything else will work out. But if you're starting from the point of, what am I gonna get? Then you're always gonna feel disconnected. Mm. And I see that, I see people 
who live like that and feel pain in their lives every day. I see that. It's not like some conceptual philosophy. We see it. I see people who are only in it for themselves and they feel disconnected, dissatisfied every single day. And then you see the other extreme where people are just trying to give too much more than they even have themselves and they also feel disconnected. Wow. And again, and they so, have nothing at all. And they have nothing at all, right? So we know, again, <clears throat> Attachment and aversion, two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. So we want to be in that dynamic balance of growth, but always to give. Yeah. So I always think, how can I go three steps deeper so that I can move three steps forward so I can give three times as much, right? It's, or that's mm -hmm. always my mentality. How do I go deeper to go more forward to give more? Yeah. And if I can get those three in action for that reason. See, it's all about the reasoning. You can do anything you like, but it's why are you doing it? Yeah, we know of course, that, right? Yeah. So. Rule number 16, train like underdogs. Now it's incredible that we root for underdogs. It's incredible that we want underdogs to win. Why? Because we're used to wanting our team to win. We're used to wanting the best to win. We're used to wanting to associate ourselves with people who are successful, right? We never go, oh yeah, I know someone who plays for that really bad team. Like, we don't say that, right? We say things like, oh, I know someone who plays for that really good team. I know someone who was MVP. I know someone who's the son or the daughter of the MVP. We try and associate or link ourselves to success. And when we do that, it in turn makes us feel more successful. It's one of the reasons why when your team wins, you say, we won, right? You say, we won. But when someone asks you, oh, how did your team do? And if they lost that day, you say, they lost. You rarely say, we lost. It's incredible how psychologically we distance ourselves from failure and we closen or liken ourselves to success. But the exception to that rule is the underdog. We all get excited by underdogs. We all get motivated by underdogs. We feel completely enamored by the story of the underdog. Prashant, underdogs are just simple-minded. They don't have expectations and don't have anything to prove to anybody. And Prashant, you've just hit the nail on the head. That's the principle I'm trying to get across. Actually, we should play like champions and train like underdogs. Why? Because the underdog works in a way not worrying about what anybody else thinks or believes. That gives you an edge. It gives you a phenomenal advantage. When you're not actually worried about what will people say, when you're not concerned by, am I going to fail? Am I going to look worse? Is what I'm doing not going to succeed? As an underdog, you don't let those things cloud your mind. You can focus in on the task at hand. See, when we become successful, even as underdogs, if we've risen to success, the biggest enemy of that success, the biggest Achilles heel, the biggest thing that can trip us up is not reconnecting to that feeling of an underdog. So no matter how much success you've achieved, no matter where you are, always remind yourself the mindset of an underdog is the mindset that nurtures talent, that nurtures success, that harnesses your true potential. Rule number 17, go through hurdles. This man began singing and playing the guitar at age four. His parents didn't want him to watch too much television. He was banned from playing video games, but he had a lot of books about art. He didn't enjoy school and was even bullied at age 15. A year later, he decided to quit school and follow his dreams of making in the music industry. Now things didn't go as planned. He ended up homeless, sleeping often on trains just to get by. This lasted for around three years where he had nowhere to live. He spent multiple nights and days performing to small groups, often without even eating. To his surprise, some of his tracks went viral on iTunes, even reaching the number two spot on the iTunes chart. By the end of the year, his album had sold 801,000 copies, making it the eighth best-selling album of the year. His latest song was one of the most listened to worldwide. His name? Ed Sheeran. Today, he's mentored by Elton John. Paul McCartney says that he's a fan. He's even written songs for Taylor Swift, One Direction, and many, many more. Ed's story teaches us that there's no such thing as an overnight success. He was so shocked and surprised when his album went viral online, but when you look at the struggle before that, you see the pain he had to go through. Often we only view people's success as what we see in their highlight reel and we forget what they actually had to go through to get to that stage. And that's why the next time you see someone that you think is successful, don't focus on what they're doing now. 
Focus on what they did to get there. Rule number 18, grow your brand. What are the people not understanding about video? Okay. What are they not understanding about how powerful it is for their business, their brand, and ultimately their message to impact people? It's always that same question. What's the ROI on social media? Right, what's the ROI? Now the funny thing is, your business work and service, my business work and service, literally lives off of social media. Mm -hmm. So there's obviously an ROI. But the problem is we live in a world where we want everything to be measurable. And there's a beautiful Einstein quote that says, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that you can count counts, mm -hmm. right? And we live in this world where everything needs to be measured. Like, oh, that video has a million views, how many sales did you get through that? But it's like life doesn't work like that. There's a load of adverts and billboards on the street that the biggest brands pay for that don't convert into direct sales. Do you think that Coca-Cola looks at the billboard out there and goes, how many people saw that advert today and how many people bought a Coca-Cola because of that advert? They don't have that number, mm. it doesn't exist. And they're one of the biggest brands in the world, but they still do it. So social media and video is just a new billboard. Mm -hmm. And the biggest brands know that the more you see it, like, I mean, <laughs> this is funny, I saw this today, I saw a big billboard outside of my hotel that has all the Jenners and the Kardashians wearing their Calvins. Have you yeah, seen it? Yeah, yeah. Right, I saw it straight away this morning, then I saw it on Instagram, and then I saw it everywhere. So already, I've seen it in three places, now, I don't need women's Calvin yeah, yeah, underwear, yeah. but the point is that I've seen it in a million places. So anyone who's not using video hasn't understood that more people are gonna see video than anything else. And not just that, video is so much better than a billboard. Mm -hmm. You can say so much more. Right. So for me, it's just a lack of seeing opportunity. There's a, there's a great, I think this is a, a old tale, it's not true, but, but it's told that when Nike first went to India, they went there, and it's not Nike, it's any, any sneaker brand, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a nice story. And when they first went to India, they saw everyone was barefoot. <clears throat> so the first reporter came back and said, oh, there's no market there because no one wears trainers. <laughs> and then the second reporter went there and he said, oh, no one wears shoes. And then he came back and says, we've got a huge market out there. Right, and it's the way you see it. Right, that right, someone right, right. saw no one wearing shoes as no market, but another person saw everyone not wearing shoes as a market. Right. And that's what video is that you can sit here and debate the ROI on video for as long as you want. But the truth is every major brand has invested in a front window that may not translate to direct sales or work or whatever it is, right. but it does. Do you think every brand should be using video? Every brand should be using video. Rule number 19, choose love. I'm almost 30 and I don't feel like I've accomplished anything in life. I made a promise to myself while I was at university that I would get a job that excites me every morning. But right now I'm afraid I'm not going in that direction. That note was written by a young person and when I read it, my heart sank. I felt that way because I know so many people that are in that exact position. I remember when I decided to trade my nine to five for a 24 seven, it was because I wanted to do something that was meaningful every day. I wanted to do something that was purposeful and fulfilling from the moment I woke up to the moment I went to sleep. The one thing I didn't know before I started is how achievable that was, but also what it required. When I transitioned from my nine to five, or actually my nine to nine to a 24 seven, I realized that I was going to have to work harder, smarter, and faster. And that step was full of fear, full of anxiety, full of insecurity, full of questions like, what will happen if it doesn't work? What will people say? Should I just have stayed where I was? I went through all of those emotions all at the same time, and then something came to me. I wrote down the various options that I had in life at the time, and I wrote a word above them that I believe summarized the experience or the result of what I thought that would give me. Some of them said ego, because I thought those careers career paths would give me a boost to my ego. Some said security because there were certain roles or jobs I could take that would provide a certain level of financial security. And then one path said the word love because I knew if I did that, that I would love every moment even if it was truly challenging and sometimes really difficult to deal with. And that's why I'm here today making this video, speaking to all of you because I chose the path that had the word love above it. Try that exercise, try that activity out to try and differentiate the motive, the intention behind what you're choosing and selecting in life. Now, just because you choose the word love doesn't mean that everything's gonna be smooth sailing and that you're going to be successful. It's going to have its own ups and downs. And that's why wherever you go with your heart, take your head with you. Rule number 20, make wisdom go viral. What's the impact that you wanna have on the world? I think you've, you've, you've said it so beautifully so many times and shared my vision, which is wonderful. And it's wonderful to know that we, we share the same thing. 
It's making wisdom go viral. There's an incredible study in 2017 that said the most successful people in the world, healthy, wealthy, and wise, choose education over entertainment. The impact I wanna have on the world is I wanna transform and revolutionize the entertainment industry so that it becomes educational without anyone knowing. So it's still completely entertaining. It's still like watching Netflix, but you're learning about human behavior, the mind, neuroscience, and everything without even knowing you are. To me, that's the greatest win that we can have for our society. How many people are gonna quit watching Netflix and reading a book every night? I don't know. But if we can make that book come to life on Netflix, that's gonna change the world because that's what people are gonna consume. So for so long, media has been used to numb people, to, to switch people off. If we can use it to excite, elevate, enlighten people, not by just, not by like the cheesy way of like, oh, let's follow someone through their journey of enlightenment. It's not like that kind of stuff. I mean like really entertaining programming where you can learn by being entertained at the same time. If I can do that by changing the, the most powerful industry in the world, then I will feel that I've had some, some what of an impact. Because that way I think we'll reach the world without having to get everyone to change their habits too much. Uh, my, my thing is how do we meet people where they are and, and really deliver a message and a powerful expression of love. And to me that's the highest form of compassion. The highest form of empathy, love and compassion is to meet people where they already are rather than expecting them to change. Rule number 21, stop caring what others think. We all feel that rejection kills dreams. We all feel that failure kills dreams. We all feel that people kill dreams. You can't kill my dreams. But actually, there's four words that we say in our heads to ourselves that genuinely have destroyed more dreams than all of those things put together. Those four words are, what will people say? What will people say? How many times have you stopped yourself from doing something because you're scared of how people will react? How many times out of the fear of someone else's opinion or criticism have you stopped yourself from doing what you believe in? How many times has someone's perception or perspective stopped you from living your potential? No matter what you choose to do, there will always be people who find fault with it. There will always be people who criticize, complain, who try to bring you down and tell you that what you're doing isn't right. Haters gonna hate. It's crazy that we give up what we most want in life just based on people's opinions. And the crazy thing is, if we're living for other people's opinions, we'll never be right. There'll always be someone with something that they won't agree with. And this is why it's so important that we work with our own conviction. We work on what matters to us. It was Aristotle who told us that there were only three ways to avoid criticism. Do nothing, say nothing, be nothing. And I'm sure none of us want that of our future. Rule number 22, live fully. When we die, our lifeline does this, right? It looks like this. When you're living, your lifeline's doing this. Notice how that connects with our real experience of life. Real life is ups and downs. Stagnant life, death looks like this. Being an entrepreneur looks like this. One's living, one's dead. You choose. When I saw that and I started to visualize that, I realized that every time I failed, every time things went wrong, every time I chose to risk to live my passion and things didn't work out and they don't work out, even now they don't work out. And when I analyze the lives of entrepreneurs and look at how things haven't worked out, I just remind myself, that's living, that's not. Rule number 23, make your life about service. If you're a musician, serve. If you're a coder, serve. If you're a orchestra leader, serve. If you're a entrepreneur serve, like make your life about service and helping other people, not just to feel good, but make that the reason why you do what you do. Mm. Don't make that what happens because you have money. Make that the reason you do what you do. Yeah. And if people start with service, then you'll experience love, then you'll experience compassion, then you'll experience gratitude. Service is, Gandhi said it, you find yourself when you lose yourself in the service of others. And, and that's the deepest level of self-actualization. So right. know that you're the soul and the consciousness, not the body. Know that you have a unique genius and don't settle for any less. 
and use both of those to serve other people as the reason for the first two. Rule number 24, prioritize growth. I remember this video that went viral around two years ago where this young girl, around two years old, started to crawl and walk in her parents' living room. She went up to the television screen and she decided to try and get it to swipe. She started doing this with her little hands and fingers, hoping that the television screen would swipe. To her complete bewilderment, the television screen did not swipe. Oh, come on. All of a sudden, tears started to run down her eyes because she, in her two-year-old life, had never come across a screen that didn't swipe. It doesn't work. What do you mean it doesn't work? It doesn't work. She probably used her parents' iPad or laptop. She used her parents' screen, and she'd been seeing screen swipe for two years. But this screen did not swipe. In two years, she had developed a belief that every screen in her life swipes. Imagine if in two years, she was completely conditioned to believe that every screen swipes, how quickly we all become conditioned in two decades, four decades, six decades, or even more. They say that the biggest challenge today is not simply to learn, but to learn, unlearn, and relearn. Wait, what? So I want you to think about, in your mind, the one habit that you want to change. Now, if you truly want to change a habit, psychologists and researchers say it will take anywhere from 21 to 90 days. If you want to change anything in your life, you have to start with a small step, but make it a big priority. One of the biggest mistakes people make is they try to make big changes and make them a small priority. I had it backwards. Rule number 25, don't settle. What happens in society is that we're clouded by the noise, the noise of family expectations, the noise of our parents. I grew up in a family where you could either be a doctor, a lawyer, or a failure. Those were my three options. Anything else would just count me as a failure, right? I'm standing up here in front of you all as a failure. We focus so much on life in what we want to be, as opposed to who we want to be. We've always been told that life and jobs and careers are like boxes and containers. There's only a finite number of options. You can decide right now that I don't want to be defined by this box. I don't want to be defined by this container. I don't want to feel that if only I live in this container, then I'll be able to be successful. Rule number 26, find self-awareness. Most of us just throw ourselves into the deep end and then try swim and figure it out. Right. Monk life actually, begins at like five years old. Like the training of, monk life is ultimately training in self-actualization and self-awareness. Mm. It's meant to start when you're five. The problem is we all went to normal schools that try to put stuff in us rather than take stuff yeah, out of us. Crazy. You talk about this, right? right. right? Like you, you, know, you were told at school that you weren't very good and right. you weren't good at English and now you have a New York Times bestseller, right? right, right? right yeah. and, it, and it's like, but no one noticed that potential inside you. No one noticed that, oh, Lewis was really creative. Right. And you're not the only person. There's so many people who feel like that. So the modern schooling system didn't extrapolate your self-actualization, your element, and just try to put maths, English, science inside. Mm -hmm. So the point is that you're trying to get to a, such a strong foundation that when you interact in the world, you're going with a sense of strength, fuel, energy to make a difference. Rather than going into the world and then going, oh my God, where am I trying to figure it out? And I find what happens today is that when you don't, we all know this, we, I mean, self-love has become such a big thing now. Mm -hmm. That when people don't figure out, yeah, it's like a huge trend now. <laughs> but, but my point is that if you don't start at a place where you have self-awareness, self-actualization, you have figured out what works for you, what your strengths are, how you want to be in an environment, when you walk out there, most of us just pretend to be someone else. Most of us get lost. Most of us get carried away. Yeah. So my point is, Strengthen yourself, grow yourself, and then of course interact with the world. Rule number 27, go beyond wanting money. Steve Jobs said that you should never start a company with the goal of getting rich. It should be about starting a company to make something you believe in. We should dream to make a difference, break down boundaries, build beyond borders, and ignite ideas to innovate incessantly and create for people what they can never conjure up themselves. Henry Ford said that if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And that's the beauty of going beyond wanting money and going beyond wanting fame and going beyond wanting power, that you actually craft something that evolves people's daily lives, that you actually create something that enhances someone's human experience. 
People respond to people who want to do more than just gain for themselves. We're attracted by selflessness. We're attracted by renunciation. We're attracted by the quality of when people want to give rather than take, when they want to share rather than keep, and when they want to do and serve rather than just hold. Steve Jobs said, being the richest man in the cemetery doesn't matter to me. What matters to me is going to sleep feeling like we've done something wonderful. Rule number 28, use your time wisely. I'm not telling you to not work at a corporate. I think corporate experience is great. What I'm saying is, don't lose this voice. Work till 6 p.m. every day, then go home and work on what you actually care about. Use your weekends to not be on Instagram and actually do what you care about. When you do that, you're investing in your meaning. You can be making enough money and make the switch. That's what's up for all of you who have a great degree, have a great education, you've got that job lined up. Use it. Just don't become a servant of that job. Don't just say, oh, I'm in prison now, I'm just gonna use my weekends to hang out. If you do wanna do that, that's cool too. If you say to me, Jay, actually, whatever you're saying, I don't even want that, I just wanna hang out and have a good time. I don't even want meaning or purpose. That's cool with me too. But if you wanna be happy and you wanna be fulfilled and you wanna have an impact on the world, then use your time wisely. I used to go home after my corporate job at 8 p.m. and edit till 1 a.m. on my own every day. So do your job, get a job if that's where you need to go with it. If you can't go all in, be safe, be secure. But then don't waste that time on, on not doing that and then complaining that you don't have what you want. Rule number 29, stop chasing a false reality. One thing I've been observing is that achievement or ambition is broken down into five stages. Learn, experiment, perform, struggle, thrive. Right now the challenge with all of those is, is that we want to thrive all the time. We want to be in thrive zone. We want to be winning those awards, getting those views, getting those messages, getting those likes all the time. We want to be noticed and recognized. But actually if we took a step back, we realize we need to be learning. We need to be experimenting. And so what happens is that we get confused by where we are and so our expectation of what we want is totally blurred and we start chasing a false reality. And that's why we find that we get disappointed and confused when we know we should actually be performing. We actually need to do, we need to act rather than chasing that thriving feeling all the time. So next time you think things aren't working out, next time you feel you're not on the right track, step back and ask yourself, should I be learning? Should I be experimenting? Should I be thriving? Should I be performing or should I be struggling? And that one comes around a lot more than you can imagine. Rule number 30, don't live for the approval of others. Let me tell you about this girl called Cleo. I think you might know someone like her too. She had the dream of becoming a model. She said she was going to move to LA to pursue it seriously. She took care of herself, at least her body well. Someone told me she did ads for L'Oreal. She had so many followers on Instagram who all loved her. Within a minute of her posting a picture, there would be hundreds and hundreds of comments, all telling her how beautiful she was, how good she looked, comment after comment, like after like. She was a real entertainer. She was always making everyone laugh. I remember every guy wanted her number, but, but she kept to herself. She just had this infectious energy. She got along with everyone. She was always the life of the party. She was never seen in the same outfit twice. Boxes and boxes of Amazon Prime. On Instagram, she was the perfect girl with the perfect life. The perfect world with the perfect guys. But nothing's perfect, right? It seemed like she was always having the best time with her friends, always traveling new experiences and so many great stories to share until people started to notice. I think she lived like two lives. No one really knew her inside. She had everyone to text, but no one to talk to. Everyone to follow, but no one to walk with. When the phone was up, her world was a stage. When it was down, her reality came. She had an invite to every event, but still felt lonely. She had all the friends in the world, but still felt no one really knows me. She was going through pain, but never showed that side. It was something she hid from the world. Or maybe we just never asked. She had masked her sadness with what looked like the ideal life. She was always flying high in the air, but felt low inside. Her inbox was always full, but she felt empty within. She was happy on the outside, but struggling with depression and anxiety. She had an addiction that everyone called a lifestyle, but she was struggling with mental health 
but people were just occupied by her physical appearance. See, people think depression is sadness. People think depression is crying. People think depression is being quiet. Depression is when we smile, but we want to cry. It's when we talk, but we want to be quiet. It's when we pretend like we're happy, but we're not. Depression is not always obvious. She drank to drown her pain, but the pain learned how to swim. She was sick of crying, tired of trying, smiling, but inside she was dying. It's amazing how we can think we know someone and still not know them at all. I don't think we understand how stressful it is to explain what's going on in your head when you don't even understand yourself. We use filters to lighten our photos whilst we carry the heavy weight of stress. Remember, it's okay to have highlight reels, but make sure someone knows how you really feel. It's okay to use FaceTime, but make sure you spend quality time face to face. It's okay to have followers, but make sure you have true friends. Don't live for the approval of others. Document the moments you're most in love with yourself, not just the moments you think people will love the most. When someone doesn't post for a few days, we ask if they're okay. When someone posts every day, we assume they are. Tell people you love them. Be a trustworthy friend. Tell them that they matter. Tell them that they've survived a lot and they're ready to thrive now. People who care will ask how you're doing. People who love you will wait till you tell the truth. And that's why Robin Williams said, I used to think that the worst thing in life was to end up alone. It's not. The worst thing in life is to end up with people who make you feel alone. Rule number 31, never regret a day in your life. We can't control time, we can't control the future, but we can choose how we feel today. We can choose what we do today, we can choose who we meet today and where we go. Stop waiting for Friday, stop waiting for summer, stop waiting for that ideal job, stop waiting for someone to spot your talent. It's not about waiting, but about making the most of each moment right now. Ask yourself, if this was the last day of your life, is this how you would like to spend it mentally? Up here. You might not be able to change what you do, but you can change how you feel about it. If you have to spend the day at work, ask yourself, how can I make it more meaningful? If you're at home with your family, ask yourself, how can I make it more fulfilling? If you're around people you don't like, move, we're not trees. And if you're in a toxic environment, learn to protect yourself. And no matter how little you have or how tough things are, see where you can be grateful. That book that's been on your mind, write it. That video that you've been scripting, shoot it. That business that you want to launch, start it. That skill you've been wanting to gain, learn it. Don't wait for the perfect moment. Take the moment and make it perfect. Never regret a day in your life. Good days give you happiness. Bad days give you experience. The worst days give you lessons. And the best days give you memories. Rule number 32, visualize. Whether it's David Beckham taking one of his famous free kicks, or whether it's Lewis Hamilton winning the Formula One, or whether it was Steve Jobs about to give one of his famous keynotes, the most underrated skill was this. Visualization, the recreation of images, sounds, and environments before it has happened is one of the most powerful skills in the world. A very powerful meditation and mindfulness practice, visualization has been used for centuries to help prepare the mind, the body, and the consciousness for upcoming challenges, situations, and circumstances. Some of the world's greatest athletes use visualization as a way to prepare for big games, the big day, musicians for their new concerts and tours, and CEOs for their very important meetings. Rule number 33, solve problems. I noticed in your videos that you ask a lot of questions, mm -hmm. and I would imagine that's and intent is something that you intend to do. Yeah, I believe that the answers come from within and we're not asking the right questions. 
I feel we're always looking for the right answers, not the right questions. And the biggest companies that we respect today, the biggest organizations, all came from trying to answer a question. Mm. It all came from trying to solve a problem or a question that we were able to identify. Mm -hmm. So the, my work comes from a very simple study that I read that said the most successful people in the world choose education over entertainment. And the most unsuccessful people in the world choose entertainment over education with their spare time. Mm. So my mission has been how do we spread wisdom at the pace people want entertainment. And to me, entertainment allows you to populate the thought with your own brain. Like when you watch a character or a superhero, you can watch it from your own lens. The movie may have morals, it may have values, it may be talking about good and evil, but the movie's not deciding for you. Mm -hmm. The movie allows you a space to create and imagine and grow. So for me, that's what I want my content to do, is give people a space to populate themselves, see themselves in the characters that I'm presenting, see their own situation, and be able to come to their own conclusions. Mm -hmm. Rule number 34, take responsibility. Just around two years ago, I had this idea. I wanted to share wisdom at a pace we wanted entertainment. I wanted to share wisdom in a way that it could connect, resonate, and deeply evolve the lives of people all over the world. For 10 years before that, I'd been working with individuals, groups, coaching at universities, companies, and all of these opportunities, but I really wanted to serve and connect with everyone across the world. I wanted to make wisdom accessible to anyone who had one of these. I have one of those! So I was excited, I had the energy, the enthusiasm, and I was pitching my idea to every single company that was online. Now remember, this is before I ever made a single video, before any of you knew who I was. Who is this guy? I applied to not 10, not 20, but 30 online media companies, hoping that one of them would like my series idea. I waited a day, I waited two days, I waited a week. I was rejected by every single one of those companies before interview. None of them invited me for a phone interview. None of them invited me for a video interview. None of them even connected with me in any personal way. That's rude. I said to myself, it doesn't matter. Let's see what else I can do to try and make my goal a reality. What else you got? So I tried to network with people who may be able to give me a chance. I got one answer and one answer only. They said, you're getting older now. Most of the people who want to break into this industry are around 21 years old. Just don't worry about it. Other people said to me, look, you need to go get a media and journalism degree or a master's and then we'll take you seriously. Literally, I was getting rejected from every single person I spoke to, but inside of me, I had this desire, I had this calling, I had this mission, I had this vision that I wanted to share everything that I had learned with people out there. I genuinely tried every single possible method I could to break into the media industry to the point that the only thing that was left that I could try was to start a social media channel. And of course, you know the rest. The most incredible thing is that it reminds me of a really powerful thought from Thomas Edison. He once said, when you believe you've exhausted all options, remember this, you haven't. That thought stayed in my mind the whole time. What I learned from all of this rejection, from all of this failure, from all of these clear no's, was one really important thing. And today, I wanna give that as a gift to you. Me? If you have a dream, you have an idea, you have a vision, we have to take the responsibility to prove our worth before we expect anyone to value our talent. When I started crafting and creating my own videos, teaching myself how to edit, learning how to produce, understanding the mechanics of social media, when I started putting my energy into that space, that's when people started to take notice. That's when people started to listen. That's when things started to happen. This is nice. It's when I decided to take the responsibility for sharing what I was passionate about with the world and not waiting for someone external to validate me or give me permission or allow me to do that, that's what made the difference. If you're feeling you've been going through a lot of rejections, ask yourself this. Is your deeper passion and calling making you want to move further? Number two, have you truly knocked on every single door? And number three, are you working hard on investing in your expertise and passion so that you really have something impactful to offer? Rule number 35, find balance. 
There's a beautiful verse in the Bhagavad Gita that says that detachment doesn't mean that you own nothing. Okay. Detachment means that nothing owns you. Okay. And to me, that's that balance. Okay. That's that balance. It's that you know that. Like if you're going over the millions and billions, but then that starts owning you. Right. We've seen that destroy people. Right. You've seen that destruct people. So it's like the dominant energy. Exactly. But how do you think, because it's easy to fool yourself and be like, no, 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 I'm not dominated by money, but like, how, was there a litmus test? Is there a test you had in the back of your mind that you could know that you are truly detached? Well, I think there's, you know, we have both. Like one of, one of my favorite quotes, which kind of complicates the whole, whole situation is from Charles Cooley, where he said that, today I'm not what I think I am. I'm not what you think I am. I am what I think you think I am. Right. Right. And we're lost in that perception of a perception of ourselves. Yeah. So if my, all my billionaire mates are telling me, no man, you're all right. Like you've got money, you're, you're good, but you've got to have that reflection. But that's not going to come if you're just surrounded in the echo chamber. Yeah. And you talk about this loads, having mentors. Right. My thing is that when I come up with an idea, I want to know what the Dalai Lama thinks as much as what the Mark Zuckerberg thinks. Because for me, that okay. polarity right. is what allows me to not get lost in the echo chamber. Rule number 36, serve. One of the most beautiful things I learned was that serving other people was without a doubt the most meaningful experience of humanity. And there's this great study by Michael Norton from the Cambridge University where he talks about how money can buy happiness if you spend it on other people. Mm. And he's done this incredible study in all regions all across the world where he talks about how actually if people are given five, 20, or even $100, when you spend it on yourself, your happiness doesn't go up or doesn't go down. But when you spend it on other people, your happiness is the opportunity to grow by at least 10 to 20%. Huh. So fulfillment grows when we use our money, time, energy in the service of others. And when I was working at internships, I felt like I was serving myself. And I wasn't getting an opportunity to impact someone else's life. We've all been in that, and I'm sure you have, been in that position where you've just made a difference in a young person's life, yeah. or you've made a difference in someone who doesn't have much, and you see the joy on their face. And that's what I was getting to experience as a monk on a daily basis. Rule number 37, press pause and reflect. Albert Einstein famously remarked in a conversation with Werner Heisenberg, he said, you know, in the West, we've built a beautiful ship and in it, it has all the comforts. But actually the one thing that it doesn't have is a compass and that's why it doesn't know where it's going. This paradox of our times was propounded by the Dalai Lama when he said we have wider freeways but narrower viewpoints. We have taller buildings but shorter tempers. Will Smith said that we spend money we haven't earned on things we don't need to impress people we don't like. And it's phenomenal how the same technology that brings us close to those who are far away takes us far away from the people that are actually close. 30 billion WhatsApp messages are sent per day, but 48% of people say that they feel lonelier in general. The paradox of our times is that we have more degrees but less sense, more knowledge but less judgment, more experts but less solutions. It was Martin Luther King who said that the irony of our times is that we have guided missiles but misguided men. Have you ever found it perplexing that we've been all the way to the moon and back but we struggle to start a conversation across the road or across the train and it's amazing that Bill Gates was known as the top earner in 2015 with a wealth of 79.2 billion but one in four CEOs claim to be struggling from depression and do we actually thrive off this paradox is it that this paradox actually makes the media interesting it's what makes journalism interesting it's what makes politics interesting it's what makes television interesting is this paradox actually what we feed off and what we live off and what we talk about and discuss in our circles doesn't it seem that we've tried to clean the air but polluted our soul? We've split the atom but not our prejudice and we're aiming for higher incomes but we have lower morals. So I'm hearing you ask, how do we bring a change? How do we dissect this paradox that exists in our lives? And it starts by us, each of us, pressing pause, pressing reset and then pressing play again. Taking a moment to become more conscious, taking a moment to become more aware, taking a moment to really reflect on the consequence, the implications of a misplaced word, of an unnecessary argument that we all know we didn't need to have, or to speak to someone just slightly differently in a different tone, in a different voice, in a different empathy, with a different perspective, just to really connect with people on a different level. This thinking out loud started from Albert Einstein, and I'll track back to him when he actually said that the 
problems we have today can't be solved with the same thinking we used when we once created them. So actually we need to research alternative teachings. We need to deep down dig into those ancient books of wisdom. We need to go back to understanding if there's anything written in those creased pages of time that can actually reveal more knowledge and more wisdom of how we can transform our experience of light today. Otherwise, this paradox means that every step forward we take, we're taking three backwards every time. Rule number 38, start your day with gratitude. Finding some space, whether it's 10 minutes a day, five minutes a day, just to start with gratitude. I think that's the beginning of this journey. So what do you mean by that? Is it so, writing yeah, down yeah, on yeah. a journal, I'm thankful that I'm healthy today. I'm yeah. thankful that I live in the California. More, the more specific your gratitude is, the deeper it is. So the more like it's like, oh, I'm thankful that I breathe, which is just everyone breathes. Yeah. The more specific we get about our particular situation. Yeah. Like I'm just happy that I was able to walk into work today and have meaningful relationships with the people I work with. Yeah. Or I'm just happy today that I'm, I'm standing with Ty. Right? right, that's that's a real specific gratitude, not that oh I'm in LA and it's sunny, right? Which, which a million people are experiencing. Yeah, and so something people, very yeah, specific. Very specific. Rule number thirty-nine: Focus on true wealth. I believe that wealth is beautiful and brilliant. It can do incredible things in the world when used to make a difference. When we use any wealth that we have to make an impact, to use it to make an influence, to help serve and support the lives of others. But today, I want to talk to you about a different type of richness. There's more than one. One of my favorite teachings about wealth has been this. You can tell how rich you are by counting the amount of things you have that money cannot buy. There's a beautiful quote by Jim Carrey where he says, I believe that everyone should become rich, famous, and achieve everything they want just to realize that it's not the point. That would be nice. Real wealth, inner wealth, fulfillment, satisfaction, meaning and purpose is a rich list that every single one of us can have and be on. I want you to take a moment to make a list of the things you have that money cannot buy. Maybe it's a beautiful family. Maybe it's an incredible partner. Maybe it's a passion and a drive that you've recently found and discovered for yourself. Maybe it's a recent experience that you had that wasn't really about where you were, but more about who you were with and what you were thinking about. The reason why I'm focusing on this rich list is because this list is something we often forget. It's not on the front page of a magazine. It's not inside the newspapers. It's not on the list online. But this list is one that you can look at every single day to remind yourself how fortunate, how grateful, and how incredible your life truly is. Rule number 40, travel. Once a year, go someplace that you've never been before. Travel empowers the learner inside of us, increases our curiosity and our humility. The Journal of Personality and Social Psychology found that kids who study abroad were more humble than those who didn't travel. Being in the outdoors refreshes your senses in a way that no office air ever could. The latest evidence, in a new study published in the journal Environmental Psychology, researchers found that people who simply looked at a photo of nature for only 40 seconds had improved focus and performance on their next task. And this is my favorite thought. At first, travel leaves you speechless, and then it turns you into a storyteller. Rule number 41, build the mini dream first. How do you know your dream is your dream? How do you go after something that you don't know if it's actually meant for you or not? Great question. I think the number one thing to do is to build the mini dream first. So before trying to go off on this huge journey of building this humongous dream, build the mini version of it and see what it feels like. So. If you want to be someone who travels across the world and performs, travel to one city and perform. If you want to be someone who's in movies, go and film a short movie, right? Like go and build the mini version of that dream because that mini dream is going to teach you so much. Like I'll give you an example. I know so many people who say to me, I want to be an actor. And I'll be like, okay, great. Well, let's make a short movie. 
And when they make a short movie and they realize they're up at 5 a.m. every day and that they're in the studio or on a set till 10 p.m. and they realize the set is not very glamorous, that they realize they have to say the same line 30 times before the director says that line is okay, they realize they don't want to be actors anymore. Because what we've fallen in love with is what the dream looks like and not what the dream is. So my biggest advice to anyone, including myself, has always been build the mini dream. And the mini dream will teach you everything you need to know about whether you're ready for the big dream. It's the same as sports. If you want to be a sports player, wake up at 4 a.m. every day, go to the gym for two hours a day. Like do the actual schedule, do the actual process of the person who's already doing it. So I always say look at what people were doing when they were at your age, not on the stage they're at now and do that and see whether you love that. That's how you figure it out, just on a very small level. Rule number 42, follow your intention. I've talked to people who, who've, who've succeeded and, and they all seem to have this idea of intention. Mm -hmm. This idea of I'm gonna think about you know where I'm going with my life, have a plan, some people call it goal setting. Sure. Um, and I just wonder if you had that in mind, that this was sort of a step mm -hmm. towards something else. My genuine response to that is I wanted to be a monk for the rest of my life because I thought, I thought that would be my best point of service. So my intention was to serve and to give knowledge and to give wisdom and to give insight mm. by studying and going through the growth myself, but it was to do it as a monk. Like, did I ever think I would be on videos and social media or even sitting with you here today? No. Did I ever imagine and envision a path for me to be moving to LA or living in the US? No, like those weren't, and, and I speak about that often, it's interesting. I, I talk about how I, I never really had a vision board. I never had that goal. Mm. I just had a deep intention that I wanted to learn and share that knowledge. Mm. I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know how it would work. And I didn't have a step-by-step -step process. Mm. I just knew that that deeply was where I wanted to start from. Rule number 43, reinvent yourself. It's incredible the amount of individuals, institutions, businesses that have absolutely been destroyed overnight because people at the top believed that the way they've done it for decades is the way that they should build the future. Do it again. Remember, you can't get anywhere new if you're always doing the old. It's just not possible. One of my favorite examples is about this company that had the biggest market share. They had this opportunity to buy an upcoming business. That business at the time was valued at around $50 million. This large company could have bought this small company for $50 million. They said no, they turned it down. They didn't believe that streaming and online movies were the future. That big company was Blockbuster, and their little company was Netflix. It's incredible now where we live in a world where Netflix is valued at tens of billions of dollars and Blockbuster doesn't even exist anymore. It's incredible how many individuals, institutions, and businesses have had to completely shift, transform, transition, and reinvent, redefine, and recreate themselves to remain relevant. And this is a great message for all of us. We don't have to change who we are, but we have to redefine, reinvent and recreate our focus, our skills, our priorities, our abilities. We always have to recognize how what we have is relevant for the modern world and all the new challenges that come with it. If we choose to innovate and disrupt ourselves, we can never be disrupted. If we choose to challenge and experiment and test and try new things, then there's no one else who can do that for us. Rule number 44, smile. Scientists have known for some time that changing your body through actions like smiling, sitting up straight and relaxing can change your mental and emotional responses. When we change our body to sit up straight, to smile, to connect with others, to engage with presence, we automatically change the responses in our mind. We allow ourselves to feel better, to think better and to live better. It's incredible to know that simple Simple changes in our body language, in the way that we're sitting, can impact our emotional mood states. So much more insightful research has been done into this space, but if you can just take a simple step today to change your posture, to add a smile, and to relax a little, you'll see how much your mind will be at ease. Rule number 45, doubt yourself. You seem to be someone with great confidence and, and, and wisdom at, at your young age. 
And I wonder, um, are there moments when you doubt yourself, when, when you think, well, this isn't right, or I, you know, am I doing the right thing, or am I, am I creating the right message today? Hugely. And I think that that's a practice that I hope I never lose. Because I think that's the practice that makes you want to learn more. Mm. It makes you want to refine your message. And it also stops you from putting out content for pressure. So I think we live in a world, especially on social media, where there's such a pressure to put out content at volume and to keep up with everyone else's videos and numbers going up and views. And for me, that checking system that you just spoke about, that's what helps me step back and go, do I really believe this? Or did it just sound good for a moment? And so I hope I always keep that. That doubt, I find it as a valuable tool. And I'm always going around in that process. I had that recently where I've really, re I got offered book deals from everywhere I could have ever dreamed of after my first video went viral. And I've resisted signing with anyone because my personal goal is to write a book that I actually believe in mm. and not write it just because it's going to sell well. And so a lot of people are like, you're taking too long, it you know, but I'm just like, but it's a book, like people are gonna pay money and spend their time to read this book. Mm -hmm. The content has to have substance yeah. and I have to really feel like I've crafted something of value. Mm. So I love that. I love that I doubt myself and I hope I never stop. Rule number 46, increase your attraction. We spend over 47% of our time when we're browsing the internet or on our mobile phones procrastinating. And we check our phones around 86 times per day. Put your hand up if you check it more than that. So it's no surprise that we all face distraction. We all experience distraction. We're all plagued by distraction. But often we think that the opposite of distraction is focus. We think that we need to become more focused. We think that if we're focused, we'll feel less distracted. We feel that if we're able to draw our energy in a certain direction and force ourselves to absorb in an activity, then we won't be as distracted. But this is just not true. The opposite of distraction is actually not focus. The opposite of distraction is, wait for it, attraction. Let me explain what I mean. When we're attracted to something, we're completely fixated, we're completely absorbed, we're almost addicted and obsessed to that visual, that song. What we really need to do is increase our attraction. When we are attracted to something, we're naturally focused. We're naturally able to be present. We're naturally able to bring our attention and our energy to that task, that project, that person. When we're distracted and don't have that attraction, we're naturally all over the place. We end up feeling lost, confused, and end up procrastinating. As you can see, we are procrastinating and distracting others. So now I know what you're thinking. How do you get attracted to things that you're not attracted to? We all have things in life that we love to do, and we all have things in life that we have to do. Let's take the example of your job. It's something that you have to do. It's something that you may not be attracted to. When you ask yourself, why do I go to my job? Maybe the answer is, it pays my bills. Maybe the answer is, it allows me to take care of my family. Maybe you studied for years and feel that your job at least engages you for that. Whichever one your answer is, that starts providing some value to why you do that activity. When you know that, you recognize that you are attracted to be there because it serves a particular purpose. You start becoming attracted because whenever your mind says to you, I'm bored, I'm distracted, I'm unfocused, you say, no, I'm here because it puts food on the table. I'm here because it pays my bills and takes care of my family. I'm here because I studied and worked hard for this. You're able to increase your attraction to even the things you're totally unfocused on. Now, if you found yourself distracted or unfocused for too long, that definitely can mean that you need to find more meaningful, fulfilling work. But no matter what you do, no matter how much you chase your passion and live your purpose, there will still be things you have to do on a daily basis that you don't find interesting. And naturally, you will feel unfocused and distracted. For that, ask yourself this question. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? And you'll find the mind will start to become attracted to that activity, task, or even that person. Rule number 47, serve.
This two-year-old girl was watching a cartoon in her parents' living room. At one point, one of the cartoon characters started to cry. You could actually see the tears coming out of their eyes. This young girl grabbed a tissue from the living room, walked up to the television and started to wipe the screen, <laughs> trying to wipe the tear of this cartoon character. It was an incredible show of kindness, compassion, empathy and love from this two-year-old girl. She truly believed that the cartoon character was crying and that her with the tissue would be able to wipe away its tears. Mm. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. And that was when I realized that we're wired for generosity but educated for greed. When we're young, we have this energy to give to serve, to be compassionate, to be loving, to be kind. But as we go through life, when we're faced with people being extremely challenging, when we're faced with manipulation, when we're faced with people we don't trust, that also makes us close up. I gotta pick a cabinet to hide in. What can you do today that could make a difference in someone else's life? What could you say to someone today that would absolutely change their week or their year? What is the one thing you can do that can truly change the experience of even just one person on the planet? I'll I have to think about it. My favorite quote from Muhammad Ali is that service to others is the rent we pay for our room here on earth. Rule number 48, be a storyteller. Are you a motivational speaker? Is that what you do? I like to call myself a storyteller because I feel what I'm trying to do is tell the stories that we all live. And I was just sharing with you earlier that I genuinely believe that the answers that people are looking for are inside of them. And I'm just helping people excavate and become archaeologists and, and kind of dig in and find that through them. So I don't call myself a motivational speaker because people may watch my videos and it may not be motivational. Mm. It may be reflective. Mm. It may be introspective. It may be insightful. It may be emotional. It may even take people to a place they don't want to go. Mm -hmm. So I love being sharing my stories as a storyteller. Simply what I do is make wisdom go viral. I have this fascination with wisdom, insight, deep thought, and I believe that that wisdom belongs to each and every person on the planet. Yeah. And so my desire is to scale that through entertainment, through storytelling, through video, in a way that wisdom becomes accessible, relevant, and completely involved and engaged in people's daily lives. Rule number 49, recognize that you're an instrument. And there's a beautiful story of Benjamin Franklin that he had his uh, 13 precepts before he died. He had 13 qualities that he wanted to attain in life before he passed away. They included things like integrity, simplicity, honesty, virtue, etc. And at the end of his life, he was asked, which one did you not attain? And he said, the 13th one. And they said, what was that? And he said, humility. The reason why I'm sharing that story is because the way you overcome your ego is to recognize that you're simply a channel or an instrument. When you recognize that you're an instrument, and whether you believe in the universe, whether you believe in power, whether you just believe in mentorship, mm -hmm. you recognize that everything you're giving is because someone's given to you and someone's given to that person. And therefore you're becoming a vessel, an instrument, a vehicle for the greatest powers in the world and just being a channel for that. And that allows you to feel two things. One thing is you feel liberated because now it's no longer your burden. The second thing that it does is that it allows you whenever your ego gets in the way and says, yeah, we're doing well, like I did that, I did that. You start recognizing and you get perspective and gratitude on the fact that no, actually I'm gonna pass this whatever good's happening in my life, pass it to my teachers, pass it to the people that shared it with me. Because there is no one who is self-made. We talk about self-made yeah. millionaires, there is no one, that word shouldn't even exist. Yeah. Because no one, none of us are self-made, I'm not self-made, you're right. not, like, all I'm saying is just that if we all truly reflect, and we don't, I don't want the, anyone watching to think I have to be self-made. Because if you have to be self-made, then you're gonna have to self-fall too, yeah. right? And everything will be self, 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 and you'll fall on your own and you'll rise on your own. And rule number 50, the last one before a very special bonus clip is choose change over regret. Healing is so not about getting over stuff, and it's so much about getting through stuff. And I think we have this mental, 
block in thinking I need to get over this rather than get through it. And when you try and get over something, you don't necessarily process the pain. You don't necessarily give yourself the time and the energy and the care to express how you felt and allow yourself a outlet to really let go. Yeah, and that's coming from the point of realizing that regret is painful, change is painful, but change is less painful than regret. Yeah. And so when you realize that actually the only two options I have now are regret or change, and they both hurt, but change hurts less. And when we recognize that, then we choose to change, we choose to move forward, we choose to let go of that regret because we realize that regret's not serving us. Now I've got a really special bonus skip from Jay on how to have a head, a heart, and a hand that I think you're really gonna enjoy. But before that, it's time for the three point landing questions. Time to move from just watching another video to taking action in your life or business. And if you're feeling bold, leave your answers in the comments below. Here we go. Question number one, where do you need to choose change over regret in your life? Number two, how can you serve others better? And number three, what does your mini dream look like? So in an ideal life for me is a life, and this applies to a company, an organization, an institution for me, is an ideal life is when we all have a head, a heart, and a hand, all three elements together, working in alignment. Without one or the other, we start to lose something. If you only have a head and a heart, you'll find that life is stable. And defined yeah, to those. Yeah, things. sure, 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 sure. So a head, is the clarity of vision. What you want. What you want. Knowing what you want, the way you picture life, and being able to navigate and make the decisions to get there. That's a good head. A good heart is being able to understand what your intuition and heart wants. Being able to connect and tap into that understanding deeper and beyond the vision you may have painted for yourself. So I often say to people that you'll get to where you want in life, just not in the way you imagined. And that's because the path that's paved up and down is far different to the path we pave. So you can have a great head and a great vision and a great mission and know where you want to go, but if your heart's not able to have that resilience and be able to adapt and, and have compassion and care and all of that, then, then you're not going to be able to make the toughest decisions without your heart. But to be able to realize that we need to care and be sustainable and long lasting requires a heart. And a hand is that service, wanting to pass that on, that which you have, wanting to give it forward, pay it forward. The idea of serving with what you have. I often say to people, your passion is for you, your purpose is for others. Your passion makes you happy, but when you use your passion to make a difference in someone else's life, that's a service, that's a purpose, mm -hmm. and that's the hand. Right. So those are my three elements of an ideal life. If you want some more Jay Shetty motivation, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll enjoy it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. No matter what you choose to do, there will always be people who find fault with it. Everyone should become rich, famous and achieve everything they want.